Donc bonjour à tous, bienvenue pour cette huitième édition des séminaires de la recherche organisés par le laboratoire sport, expertise et performance à l'INSEP. Bienvenue sur le site de l'INSEP et bienvenue à ceux qui nous regardent sur le site INSEP TV. On a le plaisir aujourd'hui d'accueillir mon collègue, le professeur David Bishop, qui nous vient de Melbourne en Australie et qui est à la fois euh, researcher, donc un chercheur, mais également un sport scientist qui travaille avec les athlètes de haut niveau qui travaille sur des problématiques de fatigue, de pH musculaire, de lutte contre l'apparition de la fatigue, de répétition de sprint, donc il peut toucher à la fois les sports collectifs, mais aussi l'entraînement des différents types d'athlètes de haut niveau, et qui aujourd'hui va nous parler de l'intérêt de la biologie moléculaire dans l'entraînement. Voilà. Merci David et bonne présentation à tous. <rires> Okay. Uh, merci à Claire. Uh, je ne peux pas parler en français, je suis désolé, mais je comprends un peu. Donc, c'est après la présentation, si quelqu'un veut poser une question en français, peut-être j'arrive. Um, after that, it's about the end of my French, I'm sorry. So, I hope you find this, um, this talk interesting. What um, I'd like to talk about is whether some of the stuff that we do in the lab, so the molecular biology lab, taking muscle biopsies, can also help with the athletes. And sometimes, I don't know what it's like in, um, in France, but also sometimes, sometimes in Australia, the, um, you know, there can be a little bit of conflict between what's happening in the lab and what the coaches are, are doing on the field. And I think we can get some good information from the laboratory Sometimes what we find in the laboratory just, I think, confirms what the excellent coaches are already doing. But hopefully sometimes what we do in the laboratory can also give some, some new ideas that coaches can maybe uh, incorporate into their training. So hopefully there'll be a little bit of both today, um, some confirmation of what coaches are already doing and hopefully maybe some, some new ideas. So there's the title, and it seems, I was talking to Claire, I think it seems quite timely because it seems like INSEP is about to try and um, get some more muscle biopsies um, going to look at some of these questions. I'm going to frame my presentation mostly today, if people who are familiar with the literature, this is a guy from Steve, uh, Stephen Seeler, who's an uh, American from Texas but living in Norway, and I guess he's research that he's most fam famous for is this polarized approach to training. And I'll go through, just um, before I go through that, there's different systems that people use to, to describe training. And so I'd just like to spend a little bit of time describing the system that we use quite often in Australia and that which I use quite often with my research. So what we've got here is doing a typical incremental test on a treadmill or on a bicycle or a rowing machine, wherever you do it. So this is an increase in the velocity or the power, and then these are the lactate values. And so these are, this is just a typical lactate curve where the lactate is flat at the low intensity. Then we normally find a slight increase, and then after a certain point, then we get a rapid increase. And we use these points to devise different types of um, training intensity. So before this first lactate inflection, we have level one, which we typically use for recovery. It's not really for training. In between the lactate inflection and the lactate threshold is the more the endurance continuous training zones. And there's an arbitrary halfway point. So we have level two, which is extensive endurance. So this is continuous exercise that quite a low intensity, but that can go for a long time. So this could be an hour and a half, two hour run, cycle, things like that. Then we have intensive endurance, which is still continuous exercise, but at a higher intensity. So this may be 60 minutes, fairly hard, moderate, moderate, to, uh, moderate intensity. There's also some threshold training, so LT, lactate threshold, so this is training at a rat, normally continuous training, but could be interval training around about the lactate threshold to level four. Then we have level five, which is typical interval training. So this is between the lactate threshold 
and this would be VO2 max, and then level six, which would be like sprint interval training. So I just put that on because I'll, I'll show that through my presentation, but what I'll just super, superimpose on top of that is these are the zones that um, Stephen Sealer typically uses. So he talks about his polarized approach, which is here, zone one, which is low intensity, zone two, which is around about the lactate threshold, and then zone three, which is fairly high intensity training. And by looking at a lot of different athletes, particularly with, he started off with rowing, but also looking at other types of, um, of athletes, he observed that most of the training is done in this very low intensity zone. They do some high intensity training and they do very little training around about the, the lactate threshold. So as I said, I'm gonna use this as the, the basis for my, for my presentation. And have a look initially to see whether the research supports the type of training that endurance athletes typically do. And also, as I said, try and introduce some new ideas. Okay, I think some of the videos may not work. So that might've been good that you didn't see that. So that was just, okay, that was a, a video. I think looks like the videos may not work on this presentation, so apologies for that. Oh no, here we go. So this is um, a muscle biopsy. And so this is, um, for those who haven't seen it, so what we do is we take a small amount of muscle, normally out of the thigh, and then we quickly freeze in liquid nitrogen. And then we can measure inside the muscle for, for lots of different um, things. So we might look at proteins, we look at how the mitochondria functions, we can look at the fiber type, if there's lots of slow or fast twitch fibers etc. And so I'm going to start with here. So what we've done is we went through the literature and one of the, a good marker of mitochondrial content, so how many mitochondria are in the muscle, and the mitochondria obviously supply ATP and energy, so they should be important for endurance. One of the best markers and most common markers is an enzyme called citrate synthase activity. So we can take the muscle out and we can measure this activity and we can get an idea of how many mitochondria are in the person's muscle. And what we've done, so you can see each of these dots or triangles or whatever is a different study. So these aren't all our research, this is just summarizing the literature. And you can see here what we did is we looked at the intensity of training and the change in our marker of mitochondrial content. And you can see that we don't really see any relationship. So training harder doesn't give you better improvements in the number of mitochondria you have. But if you look over here, I think this is pretty interesting. So what we've got here is the training volume. So this is, you can think of it like how many hours of endurance training you're doing per week. And this is the change in the marker of mitochondrial content. So you can see a really nice straight, or you know, a pretty good fit. There's obviously whenever you different studies and diff they have different ways of measuring things, but there's a pretty good relationship here. And so what that suggests is that the greater the volume of training, then the greater the changes you get in the mitochondria. So I think this supports the idea that for at least some aspects in the muscle, that a high volume of training is important. We've just done some further analysis and it looks like we're starting to see a bit of a plateau. So at some stage, there's probably gonna be a plateau and that if you do keep doing more training, you're not gonna get bigger improvements. But for the time being, I think the research that we're seeing with the muscle suggests that the volume of training, just as Stephen Sealer showed, does have a, an important impact on the muscle. And these are just what we did as well. We looked at the same thing with rodent studies, so studies that have been done with rats, and you see exactly the same thing. Intensity, no relationship. But if you look at the training volume, so this is the total training volume for the whole study, a really an even better relationship. So again, suggesting that the volume of training is really important. And we've also done a study that we just published last year to test out this idea. So we had 
these were just um, moderately trained people. They did normal training for four weeks, which was just three times per week for four weeks, doing interval training. Then we did here this really intensive block of training. So they trained seven days per week, twice per day, for three weeks. So this is the volume of training. So you can see a massive increase in volume. And again, what we have here is a citrate synthase activity. No real change after the little time, after the small amount of normal training. When we did the massive increase in training volume, we got an increase in their, their marker of mitochondrial content. And I think what's interesting as well, this is the graph I just showed you before, but that red diamond is that study I just showed you. So it fits really nicely on this line as well. So it kind of, again, supporting this idea, the greater the volume of training, the greater the improvement in mitochondrial content. So if I go back to, and I'll keep coming back to this, so I would say that the research says that, you know, a lot of endurance athletes, we know that they get a, a very high volume of training, and so I don't think this is anything amazingly new, especially for the coaches in the room, but the research would support that a high volume of training is really important to increase the, the number of mitochondria. So we'll keep going, looking through this. We'll have a look at what about the intensity? So this time, what we're looking at here is not mitochondrial content, but this time we're looking at mitochondrial respiration. So what that means is how, not, not how many mitochondria you have, but how good are the mitochondria that you have in your muscles? How good are they at using oxygen to produce energy? And what I've got is all the studies that have looked at this measure of mitochondrial function from no training to low intensity, up to interval training, and then up to um, um, sprint interval training. And if we look at the bottom here, it looks like, again, a nice relationship here. So if you start increasing the intensity up to fairly high intensity interval training, we get better improvements in mitochondrial function. And then either, there's not, that many studies, so it's probably difficult to make a conclusion, but either a decrease or a plateau with the intensity above there. So before, these were the sorts of studies that were getting big improvements in mitochondrial content, but these are the sorts of intensities that are required to get an improvement in mitochondrial function. And I've also got, if for people who can um, see these numbers, on the right here is the volume of training. So you can see some of these studies, even with a really low volume, but with a very high intensity, are getting big improvements in the mitochondrial function. And this also matches up. This is a, a French study, um, I think Frédéric Dazan, a few years ago. And they had, these were untrained people, but what they had was one group that did moderate intensity continuous training and they had about a 13% improvement in their mitochondrial function. And then they had another group that did high intensity interval training around about the intensity of VO2 max. And you can see they had almost three times the improvement in mitochondrial function, even though the work or the volume of training was matched. So again, it seems to improve the mitochondrial function, then the intensity of training is really important. And I think I'll try and this is maybe a little bit complex, but this is another, again, where we've been measuring mitochondrial function. This top, and you can just concentrate, just concentrate on any one of these. So this is our measure. These are all different measures of mitochondrial function, but if you just want to look at this one, as you can see, they're all basically the same, but so just concentrate on one. So this is what I showed you before. At rest, a little bit of training, and then when we did the intensive training, they got a big improvement in mitochondrial function. But what we saw here, this is the mitochondrial function expressed per milligram of muscle in your legs. What we then did was divide through by the, um, the citrate synthase activity, so our mitochondria content. So what you can think of here 
This is mitochondrial function per mitochondria. It's not exactly that, but I th it's a good way to, to think about it. And what you can see here is that nothing has, nothing has changed. So when we did the interval training, most of the improvements in the mitochondrial function weren't because each mitochondria was better, but just because you've got more mitochondria in the leg. But this is an, another study that we did. When we did sprint interval training, so this is the typical type of training you read about in the literature, so 30-second all-out effort, um, four minutes rest, these are the same measure I showed you before. So this is the one I just showed you in black and white, is the green one. But when we do sprint interval training, we get an improvement in mitochondrial function. So the function of each individual mitochondria improves with this type of training. And we're trying to do some more research on this, but what we think might be happening is if you recall, the very high intensity training doesn't increase the mitochondrial content. But what we think is happening is that this very high intensity training is replacing old mitochondria that don't work very well with new and better functioning mitochondria. So there's no change in the content, but the mitochondria that remain are better and function better. And we think that the sprint interval training is very important to get, to get this effect. So if we go back to this, so I think again, this supports the idea that some high intensity training is really important. So what we're seeing is that, and you know, again, I think a lot of the coaches know this, you can't have one type of training to do everything. So the low intensity, high volume training is important to increase the number of mitochondria, but the really high intensity training is important to have the mitochondria functioning better. And so we don't have the answer yet, but I think you just need, you need to make sure you're getting the right mix of those types of training. So some high volume training to increase the number and some high intensity to increase the function of the mitochondria. I want to look at, I'm going to look at this now and it'd be interesting to speak to the, the coaches, but most athletes don't tend to do a lot of training, at least in Australia, when I've talked to some of the coaches, at around about the lactate threshold. And another thing that's interesting is one time I was speaking with a national kayak coach and they said this to me, they said lactic acid destroys mitochondria. And they didn't have any research evidence to, to back that up, so I thought it was really interesting. So we've done some research to look at that, but it kind of matches up with the idea that athletes also don't do a lot, especially endurance athletes, a lot of training at the lactate threshold. So we've done a few different studies where we've used bases and acids and given them to athletes during training and to see how that affects their adaptations. Okay, this video may not work, but it doesn't matter. So one of the things that we, I showed you before was a biopsy at rest. Another thing that we can do is as soon as the athletes have finished exercising, so in this case cycling, we can take a muscle biopsy. You can see there they're still on the bicycle, so it's within 5, 10, 15 seconds of them finishing doing the exercise. We can take some mu a small amount of muscle out, and with that we can analyse how their muscle is adapting to that, to that one bout of exercise. So on this study here, I'll try and explain it to you. So what we did here is we had two, we had people come in twice and these were males. One time we gave them a placebo and one time, one time we gave them a mild acid which was um, ammonium chloride. So it doesn't sound great drinking acid but it's, you know, it's a very, it's a mild acid that can just change, slightly change the pH of the blood and the muscle. What we then did is they did some interval training. So they did 10 two-minute intervals at this intensity separated by one minute rest. Then we took a biopsy and then three hours later, like three hours later, we took another biopsy. And with that, what we can, we're looking at here, if you can see on the y-axis, is what is a factor in the muscle 
which is important for improving the mitochondria. So it's called PGC1-alpha, and it's referred to in the literature as the master regulator of mitochondrial biogenesis. So normally after exercise, you get an increase in this transcription factor, and that's something that tells the muscle that they need to improve their mitochondria and get ready for the next, the next type of exercise. What's interesting now, I think, is if you look at the white bar, so that's with the placebo, we get the normal increase in PGC1-alpha after exercise, but when we get them exercising with their muscles more acidic, we get much less of an increase in this factor that controls the adaptations of the mitochondria. So this is probably the first kind of evidence that there may be something, you know, I said the coach, when I first heard the coach, it just seemed a little bit crazy, but sometimes, not sometimes, lots of time coaches say, you know, really interesting things which aren't always supported by the literature. But this kind of supports what she said to me, that maybe having lots of acid in your muscles isn't good for getting mitochondrial adaptation. What's kind of interesting as well is this is a study by um, um, someone in Marty Gabala's group, a, a researcher in Canada, and they did the opposite. They did the same thing, so this is a resting biopsy, then they did some exercise, and then they took another biopsy. Again, they're looking at the same factor in the muscle, and what they saw is when they gave bicarbonate, so the idea is this time to have less acidity in the muscle, they saw a slightly better response of the PGC1-alpha. So when we make the muscle more acidic, we get worse response, and when we make the muscle less acidic, we get a better response. This is a, a study I did with, um, with Claire quite a few years ago in, in Montpellier, and we tried to do something similar, this time with mice, and I'll just see if these videos work. Not sure that anyway. So what we did is we actually with a with a syringe we put the bicarbonate directly down the mouth and into the stomach of the mice, and then we got them running on a treadmill. And the interesting thing with this is we know that they're doing exactly the same training because we've got one mouse with the with the placebo and one mouse with the bicarbonate running on the treadmill at exactly the same time. And what we're looking at here is, if we just concentrate on this first one, this was the mitochondrial respiration in one of their muscles. And so the blue is just the mouse that just sat in the cage, didn't do any training. Yellow is the mouse that did training, but with the placebo. And you can see, as you'd expect, a nice increase in their mitochondrial function. And then the red is the growth of group of mice that did exactly the same training. The only difference was before every training, we gave them some sodium bicarbonate so that every training session they were doing with less pH in their muscle, with less acid in their muscle. And so you can see this backs up the slide I just showed you, is when we were able to reduce the pH during, they did in, during interval training, these mice had a bigger improvement in their mitochondrial function. And what's also interesting is we also measured their performance. So here we have their time to, oh, this is, sorry, this is in humans this time. We've also done a similar study in humans, but without muscle biopsies. And this was their time to exhaustion before training. Then both groups did exactly the same training. One group, the yellow group, had a placebo before every training session, and the red group had sodium bicarbonate before every single training session. And so you can see here, despite doing exactly the same training, the group that took the sodium bicarbonate before every training session had a much greater improvement in their endurance performance. So I just need to just add one thing here. So this was with moderately trained females. So these were just females who were doing, had STAPS doing sports science. There's been another study which did, um, did um, similar, similar type of study but with, uh, with um, well-trained rowers 
and didn't see this difference. So it, it may be that it works better with moderately trained and well-trained athletes, but we need, to, we need to do some more research on that. Um, this is a paper Claire published from that same study. And we also saw, so in here we're measuring, so it's not only the mitochondria, but looking at one of the important transporters in the muscle. And we saw the group, so in red, that took the sodium bicarbonate had a greater improvement in this lactate hydrogen ion transporter. So I don't think it's definitive, but some evidence emerging that if we can reduce the pH of the muscle during training, maybe we can get better adaptations in the muscle. Uh, I might keep going, just the time. I just wanted to show this as well, is that maybe I'm making a bit of a, a leap here, but this is a study by another researcher at my university, Nigel Steptoe, and what he did was he compared lots of different types of training and so you can see here the types of training, these are the characteristics here. And what he found was that this type of training in well-trained cyclists had the, the best improvement in VO2 max. What I think hopefully is interesting is what I've then done, and this wasn't in the original paper, is I've overlaid the volume of training. So. I don't think there was anything special about this type of training. It was just that it had a much greater volume, which goes back to some of the, the things I was saying at the beginning about the importance of the volume of training. But what I think is interesting is this study here, or this type of training here, even though it had a similar volume, it had a much lower improvement in VO2 max. And if you look at this type of training, you can see intervals eight minutes long, at around about 80% of VO2 max, which in these athletes would be probably pretty close to the lactate threshold, and with one minute rest. Based on what I was saying on before, this would be exactly the type of training that I wouldn't recommend to improve your, mo your aerobic metabolism and your, your mitochondrial function. And like I said, this is just one study, but looking at this, I think this again supports, this, supports the idea that there may be other benefits of doing this type of training, but I think doing this type of training where it's prolonged at around about the lactate threshold with uh, a big change in the muscle pH is probably, um, probably not the best type of training to get aerobic adaptations. Now, there may be other benefits. There may be even psychological benefits of the athletes having to train doing a very difficult type of training, but if we're just talking about muscle metabolism or aerobic metabolism, then I don't think that is the, the way to go. So if we look at that again, I think the research does support this type of model, I think. So lots of low intensity training to increase the number of mitochondria, a little bit of high intensity training to get those mitochondria to function better, and probably not doing too much of this training at the lactate threshold. I'll be interested to see what people say. And I don't know what to say here. I, um, I mean, when I use the sodium bicarbonate in the studies, it's more as a, as a research tool. But I have heard of some athletes taking sodium bicarbonate before high-intensity training. And so it may be something to consider. I don't think it's going to do any, do any harm. And it's possible especially more around this intensity, I think, rather than the sprint interval training, but more around the interval training intensity. It may be that, that type of, um, for that type of training, that sodium bicarbonate could also help. I'm not gonna talk too much, but occasionally we also do uh, some, some studies. I'll talk just a little bit about nutrition. Um, I think it's pretty well established that protein is important, but what I'll concentrate on is carbohydrate. So there's some studies recently talking about training low, competing high. In this case, they're talking about carbohydrate. So there's, I think the research is not decided, but this idea that depleting your muscle glycogen stores and then doing a training session may improve the, the adaptations to training. And so this is one study, this is from Kent Sarland's research group in Sweden. 
and they're looking, so I've tried to be consistent, they're again looking at this marker of mitochondrial adaptation, so PGC1-alpha. And what they've got is in white, a group that was normal glycogen, and another group that depleted their glycogen before they did a training session. And what they found, if you can see here, as you'd expect, the white group, so that's the normal glycogen, they had an improvement or an increase after exercise in PGC1-alpha, but the group that exercised with low mus muscle glycogen had a much larger increase in PGC1-alpha. So this kind of, this supported this idea of training with low muscle glycogen. There's two things about this study. One is that it was um, low intensity, and the other thing that a lot of these low glycogen studies do is to get low glycogen, they do two training sessions in one day. So what they'll do is they'll do a high intensity training session in the morning to deplete muscle glycogen. Then they won't give them any carbohydrates. And then in the afternoon, they'll do um, a high intensity or they'll do another training session. And I guess, you know, one of the problems with that type of um, experimental model is you don't really know, is the increase in the PGC1-alpha due to training twice in one day, or is it because of the low muscle glycogen? So we're almost finished a study where, we actually, where we've done this. So <coughs> I'll try and explain this because sometimes it can be a little bit complicated. So what we did is that everyone came in on the afternoon and they did an interval training session. And we took muscle biopsies before, after exercise, and three hours after exercise. So that's what you see here. We had a control group that all they did was did this exercise training, did this training session in the afternoon. We had another group that trained once daily. So what this group did is the night before they did um, high intensity and also um, prolonged exercise to delete delete as much muscle glycogen as we could. Then we didn't give them carbohydrates. They, sorry, they slept. Then in the morning, we didn't give them carbohydrates. Then in the afternoon, they came in and they did this exercise session, which is the one you see in white. And then we had a group that trained twice a day. So they did the same carbohydrate depleting exercise in the morning. Then we didn't give them any carbohydrates. And then in the afternoon, they did the same exercise as everyone else. So if we just look at the, the gray and the, the training session, this was high intensity interval training. So it was quite a high intensity, around about 90% of VO2 max. So if you look just at the white and gray, this is just looking at the effect of glycogen depletion. And so if you just look at the effect of glycogen depletion, basically we don't see any difference between the gray and the white. So in this case, doing the high intensity interval training with low muscle glycogen didn't give you a better training stimulus. And I think, you know, part of the reason could be, I don't know if you can, can maybe just go back to the previous one. If you can see here, this is the normal condition. And the increase was about two times in the PGC1 alpha. And then with the low glycogen, it was around about six times. If you look on here, with our exercise, we're already in the normal condition, the control, getting a really big increase in, in PGC1-alpha. So it may be that exercising with low muscle glycogen only works on low intensity exercise or moderate intensity exercise, because maybe when you're doing high intensity exercise, maybe you're already getting the maximum stimulus. So if you try and you can't go beyond the maximum. So even if you delete your muscle glycogen, maybe you can't increase that maximum stimulus. Or it could also be that the other studies, it wasn't really due to low glycogen. It may be just because they're doing two exercises on one day. And so I think that's interesting as well. So this is when they trained twice per day is the black. And you can see that, so they did the exercise, the carbohydrate depleting exercise here. Then they came back three hours later and they've got an increase already in the PGC1-alpha from the previous exercise. And then when they did another exercise, we get a further increase 
in this marker of um, mitochondrial biogenesis. So what I think is maybe happening there is when you do the first exercise, you're getting an increase. And because it's already increased, the second stimulus is being superimposed on top of the first stimulus. So I think from this, what we saw, just to sum up, is exercising with low muscle glycogen didn't seem to give a better stimulus to the exercise. But training twice on one day, which I know athletes do, we did see a, an increase in the, in the mitochondrial stimulus. So that may be something to consider sometimes. So if we go back to here, and I'll keep adding things on. So maybe, and I think we need more research, maybe for low intensity exercise, exercising occasionally with low carbohydrate could be a way to increase the exercise stimulus. And occasionally, maybe doing the high intensity training in the afternoon after doing a training session in the morning may be a way to, to also increase the training stimulus. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll finish on two other things. Another thing that's popular, I know I've been in here at INSEP one time before inside the, the cryo chamber, so doing cold water immersion or some sort of cold after exercise is also getting popular. So I just want to look at that as well. So this is post-exercise, and this was probably one of the, the first studies. And what they showed here is that, so this is again, sorry, there's no, this is before exercise, immediately after exercise, and three hours post-exercise. And again, the change in this marker of mitochondrial adaptation. They saw just a, this was quite a low moderate intensity exercise. They saw just a small increase in PGC1 alpha. And when they put the athletes in cold water immediately after the exercise, they saw a much greater stimulus for the mitochondria. So they suggested that maybe cold water, cold water immersion after a training session may be a way to improve the training stimulus. We've recently done a similar study, and so these are, are lots of different things. This is PGC 1 alpha, but these are also other markers of the mitochondria. But this time we did sprint interval training. And when we did sprint interval training, you can see here we don't see much of an effect of cold water immersion. So the, the cold water immersion could be maybe to help inflammation or recovery. So I'm not saying that cold water immersion won't help the recovery. But at least with the very high intensity exercise, it doesn't really seem to have a big impact on the, on the skeletal muscle adaptation. And this may be because, like I said before, is that you're already getting such a big stimulus that maybe the cold water can only add a little bit. Having said that, I mean, when we do research, we sort of talk about significant differences. If you look, if there is a difference, it's nearly always the black or the cold water that's above the placebo. So I think one of the takeaways is the, the, having the cold water immersion after the high intensity exercise didn't give you a worse response. So I think, you know, based on this, these data anyway, if you are doing cold water immersion after high intensity exercise, then I, then I don't see a problem. And this is from um, Shona Halsam, who's from the Australian Institute of Sport. And this time she did the same type of study without muscle biopsies, but with cyclists who are training at the Australian Institute of Sport. And again, she didn't see significant difference. So the black is the cold water and the white is the control. But again, the cold water was always a little, a couple, one or two percent better than just the, the control there. So coming back here, so it looks like the cold water immersion after a training session probably won't hurt things. If it's going to be of benefit, I think it's more likely to be of benefit for the very low intensity training, but it doesn't seem to have a negative effect on the high intensity. <coughs> 
I think the, I just want to highlight a few extra points here as well on why, the, why I think, in, um, if possible, using lactate threshold with training can be useful. So this is, um, I haven't got the label on here, but this is a study by Ed Coyle. And what he's got here, he's got two groups of athletes who had exactly the same VO2 max, but different lactate thresholds. So you can see the blue group has a high lactate threshold and the purple red has a low lactate threshold. And just the only point I wanna make here is if you can see here, if, if you trained both groups at 70% of VO2 max, this group here would be training level two, level three, but this group here would be training in level five and would be probably getting very different physiological adaptations. So I think this is where it's, um, at least in my opinion, it's important to take into account the individual um, physiology when assigning the training intensities. The other thing that's important, and again, everybody knows this, I think, but it's just nice to, to see it in the literature, is that they need to have a progressive increase in the training intensity. So what you can see here is this is a group from Canada. They did an exercise at I think it was about 90% VO2 max. They get a big increase in PGC1 alpha, so mitochondrial adaptations. Then it comes back down. And each time they do the same exercise, you can see the height of that gets less. So unless you're changing the exercise intensity, then you're going to be getting a smaller stimulus from the muscle. And we also see this, this is uh, some other research we've done here. So what we did is we had some participants come in, in the white, so before they did the intensive training, we looked at their changes in PGCO and alpha and they get a big increase as you'd expect. We got them to train, do the intensive training for three weeks. Then we got them to come back and that's the black and do exactly the same exercise and absolutely nothing happened in their muscle. Okay, so to me, I think this is a pretty powerful example of why, why it's important to be changing the exercise stimulus as the, as the athletes gain fitness. And this is um, what I showed you before, but I think this is also just a nice way to highlight that one of the great things about the muscle is that it's very plastic. And so what that means is it adapts very quickly. So in, this is some of the data I showed you before. So this is the black. So in just um, three weeks, we got about a 40% improvement in the mitochondria. We then gave these participants two weeks of doing no training and the mitochondria came back exactly where it was before. So it's a, a little bit disheartening for the participants. Here, they trained, they did interval training two times per day, seven days a week for three weeks, big improvement. Then they stopped exercising for two weeks and everything came back to exactly where it was before. So I think that's one of the you know, the challenges when athletes, if they get injured or also during a taper, is getting that balance right that the athletes get recovered, but they don't lose too much of the gains from training. <coughs> the last thing, hopefully, I'll just squeeze in, sorry, I'm about going to go to the wire here, is we're also doing a little bit of work on the genes. And I think whenever you talk to coaches or even scientists, we see that you can give two athletes exactly the same training and one, tr one athlete has a big improvement and one athlete doesn't improve very much. And so we're just starting to look to see if we can understand what might be some of the, some of the genetic mechanisms involved in that. And just quickly, so this is one of the ways that they do it with animals, is what they try and do is knock out a particular protein from the muscle, so that means remove it from the muscle. And then you can try and understand whether that, whether that particular protein is important for training. It'd be really nice to do this in humans, but very unethical, and also would take a very long time to, to wait for the babies and things like that so you, could, so you could use them. But we've tried to, okay, I don't know whether this will work. We've tried to, it's another video, that's weird, okay. 
We've tried to do this in a study. So we're doing a big study at the moment. This is the slow motion video. And so we've had to recruit, we've tried to recruit around about 200 people to do this particular study. What we've then done is we've measured their genotype. We found some of that agile because we're trying to keep it just to Caucasians. And we've then measured their genotype. And what we're looking at is there's some people that naturally don't have particular proteins. So this is the, the speed gene. And people who are XX don't have this protein. And people who are RR do have this protein. And these people are typically sprinters. So nearly all the best sprinters in the world have got this particular um, sequence in their genes. And endurance athletes tend to have this. We then got rid of all the, the mixed ones, the RX. And then we took these ones and we got them to do exactly the same training. So we've got one people, one type of person who's a knockout for a protein. We then took muscle biopsies before and after exercise. And we also did it three hours after exercise. Okay, some fun and games with the video. Then we got them to train for four weeks as well. And then at the end of that, we took another muscle biopsy. Okay, okay. And so I'll just show you, this is some of our pu unpublished data and we're trying to recruit more people. But again, looking at the PGC1 alpha, what we're seeing is that the people who are the more the sprint type have less of an increase in this mitochondrial marker than those who have more the endurance phenotype. And we've also looked at changes in citrate synthase activity, so our marker of mitochondria. Again, the people who are more likely to be sprinters have less of a change after four weeks of training than the ones who are more likely to be endurance based on the, this particular gene. And the people, when we look at changes in their mitochondria function, on average, we see that this group, the sprint phenotype, don't change very much, whereas those who are more the endurance phenotype have a bigger improvement in their mitochondrial function. So just to finish that up, so I think that's just something that another level that I think, you know, there's, we're not at that level yet, but I think in the future, I can see coaches using some of this genetic information to also inform their training and say, okay, based on your particular genotype, maybe you need to do more of this particular training, less of this particular type of training. And I think, you know, the challenge is then, how do we put all this together into a training program to try and get the, to get the most out of our endurance athletes? So just to finish up, this is um, another, just a summary slide from, from CELA. And it's interesting again, so this is completely separate from our results, but I think it matches up. So he's got the most important things down the bottom. So he's saying the total volume of training is well established. And I think from our literature it is w as well. Um, doing some high intensity training is also important. How do you distribute that training intensity throughout the year and also throughout a week or throughout a day? And tapering up the top, pacing we haven't looked at, but also if you get all of this right, then you can start thinking about adding in some of these other aspects. So cold water immersion, nutrition, and, and maybe in the future also genes. So, so I'll finish there. That um, some of my members of the research group who did obviously a lot of the research, and that's my family who are waiting for me at the Parc Floral. So after your questions, I'll go and see them. Okay, thanks. Merci David pour cette présentation. Je vous passe la parole pour des questions. Christine, ah non. 
Thank you, David, for your very nice presentation. Uh, you show that a lot of muscle adaptations are better uh, with, uh, when acidosis is limited and with uh, bicarbonate uh, ingestion, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, don't, don't you think that this um, induced alkalosis could also avoid a lot of um, interesting and useful adaptations? Is it clear? Yeah, no, the question's yeah. perfect. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think it's a really, it's an interesting question. We haven't seen that yet. And actually, that was the reason that we did the first study, because we thought that if we gave sodium bicarbonate, we would have less of a change in a pH, and we would get less of a change in things to do with pH regulation. And we didn't see that. We saw the, you know, the the opposite. So that was the reason we did that study to, for we, that was our hypothesis that we would get worse adaptation, if we, because we thought, you know, maybe the pH is a stimulus. But I think, you know, it's interesting too if we, um, I haven't got it here, but we've done a lots of different studies looking at changes in muscle buffer capacity, and what we find is that if we do low intensity, we don't get a change in muscle buffer capacity. If we do interval training and also not too intense, we get a good improvement in muscle buffer capacity. But if we train above VO2 max, we don't get a change in muscle buffer capacity and actually we even get sometimes a, a decrease in muscle buffer capacity. So when I do, I do a different presentation to the coaches I present, so I, I really like that because I think it's it goes against a little bit the common sense where you think that if I give the muscles lots of acid, they will re respond and they'll be better to deal with acid. Whereas our research says, no, it's actually probably not the acid. It's some, there's something to do with the intensity that's important. And I don't know if it, we don't know why yet, but there's also, if you see um, people who have kidney disease, they have a lot of problem with breaking down protein. And so they, pro they get um, protein um, breakdown. It's a big problem. It's one of the big problems with, with kidney disease. So they get sarcopenia and their, their muscles get smaller because of the, the acidosis. So I, I think that while on one hand it kind of makes sense that maybe you need the acid, on the other hand, I think maybe the acid interferes with protein synthesis. And basically everything is protein. You know, your mitochondria proteins if you you know transporters everything so I, I my we're doing more research on that at the moment so I think yeah so I think it's a really good question it makes common sense but I haven't seen any evidence that pH is an important stimulus to get adaptations from training and there may be something but we haven't yet seen anything that has um, less of a change when we when we give sodium bicarbonate I think the only thing to um, to be careful of, I know, and I don't know with training, but I know talking with, I used to work with um, the Australian kayak team, and so I guess the, the only problem they saw is that if you took sodium bicarbonate during a semi-final, you could have a very, very good semi-final, but it meant, because you're going faster and you'd get more damage to the muscle, that you'd then have a terrible final. So I think if, it's, if you're using it in a performance context, you have to be careful. And if you're also using it in the context of doing maybe two training sessions in one day, it may be that you get a, could get a better training session in the morning, but it may interfere with the quality of the training session in the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, it's uh, an extensive job, <laughs> and uh, uh, as we can see, uh, I think that Australia is a bit in front of us uh, in its capacity of uh, introducing cellular biology, molecular biology into practice, so again, congratulations. Um, I have lots of questions, and uh, I will keep some for discussion after, but uh, yeah. I was very interested in your last, or maybe slide with the pyramid system in yep. which you say that nutrition would be one of the last step if I'm right 
And it's interesting because here in the INSEP, at this moment, we have looked at a lot of uh, specific things like uh, muscle training, period, uh, periodization, and so on, methodology. And at this moment, we, we can see that some of very basic things are not managed, such as sleep, nutrition, uh, agendas, schedule, and so on. Mm. So maybe a comment. Do you mean that nutrition, basic nutrition is uh, under your pyramid, or is just that you use some very specific way of manipulate nutrition with biocarbonate, for instance? So yeah, no, it's a good question, and, and I think it's good for me to maybe clarify what I, what I said. So I th I thank you for that. I saw a, you know, stu a nice presentation Stuart Phillips gave, and I thought he used a good term. He said that training is the king and nutrition is the queen. And so it means, so I think what he's trying to say, the nutrition I think is in second place, but it doesn't mean that it's not really important as well. So I think if you have perfect nutrition with terrible training, then I don't think you're gonna be very successful. But I think if you have very good training and maybe your training, is, your nutrition is not, you know, 80, 90, you can still perform at a high level. So I think if you're trying to win an Olympic medal, then they're both very important. But I think sometimes the reason I say that is sometimes, it, sometimes nutrition is kind of easier to, in the sense for an athlete, because you just have to take the right, listen to the right people and take the right things. But I think getting the, so if you're looking at the pyramid, I'd say all of those things are important, but I would start by getting the training right first. And sometimes, you know, you come across athletes and they say, oh, what nutrition should I take? What, you know, what should I do? Or should I do cold water immersion? And you know, well, let's have a look at your training first. Once we've got your training right, then we can think about cold water immersion or altitude training or nutrition or whatever. So I think absolutely, I don't think you're going to win an Olympic medal without excellent nutrition, but at the bottom, I think the, the most important component is to, is to get the training right. Peut-être en français. Ok, si tu veux. Uh, it's a very simple one. So. Ok, on verra. Um, all your results, all, tous vos résultats sont obtenus sur des populations pas sédentaires mais actives. Mm. Um, Est-ce que tu penses que vous auriez les mêmes résultats ou que vous avez peut-être les mêmes résultats sur des populations élites Non, c'est loin, non. Uh, tu as raison que surtout nous utilisons les les populations sportives, mais pas de haut niveau. Mais dans le même temps, je pense que c'est plus facile de trouver une différence avec les sportifs. Donc, parfois, je pense qu'on peut voir les mêmes choses avec les plus hauts niveaux, mais avec les stat statistiques, c'est plus difficile de trou trouver une différence signif significative. Donc, euh, selon moi, ce sont les deux choses. Selon moi, parfois, c'est plus difficile d'avoir les mêmes résultats avec les plus hauts niveaux. Et, et parfois, euh, on peut trouver le, ces résultats seulement avec les, les sportifs et pas avec les, les hauts niveaux. Vous avez compris quelque Bravo chose Bravo pour le français, <rire> c'est parfait. <rire> ok, bien. Euh, donc, dans, la, dans ta manière euh, de discuter avec les athlètes et les entraîneurs, est-ce que ça veut dire que les résultats que vous obtenez dans, dans ces études, tu estimes que l'amplitude de l'effet, il sera toujours là, mais peut-être dans une moindre mesure Ou, ou pas Ou est-ce que c'est une interprétation Oui, ma, oui seulement j'aime tra euh, travailler dans le et avec les choses musculaires, mais dans le même temps, il faut travailler avec vous, avec l'Institut de, de sport en Australie, pour voir si nous pouvons trouver les mêmes choses avec les plus hauts niveaux. Donc, selon moi, nous devons faire les, les deux choses. Et, il ne faut pas faire le biopsie sur une idée fraîche avec les hauts niveaux. Donc, je commence avec les sportifs, et si je trouve quelque chose d'intéressant, il faut collaborer avec 
avec vous ou avec l'Australie pour voir si nous pouvons trouver la même chose avec le haut niveau. What kind of mus um, blood uh, marker can reflect muscle adaptations? We haven't seen anything yet. And um, because normally if you see something in the blood, it means that there's been some damage in the muscle. So we see creatine kinase and, and things in the blood. But I think Yeah, for the athletes, that would be uh, that would be you know there's with uh, I've seen with um, cancer patients they talk about a liquid biopsy, which means that you can look in the blood to see the same things that you might see in a cancer cell or a muscle. So I think that's the hopefully the the next step if we can find some interesting markers in the blood, it means that. We can do some of these studies a little bit more invasive with athletes, but without without taking the, taking the muscle biopsy. So I think yeah, it's lots of people trying to do that, but I think you know beyond lactate. I mean the the genetic stuff that is just a blood sample, so you only need a blood sample to be able to look at the a person's um, genetics. But I think for the moment there's. Um, There's no real way to understand what's going on in the muscle by, by looking at the blood. Hmm. <laughs> um, you spoke about uh, low glycogen training. That's something we can uh, read on uh, recently. Um, but it's always looked at the performance side. Uh, do you have any information on any data about what could be the effect from a health side? Because mm -hmm. if I if I'm right, you said that you s you you used the protocol in which they didn't uh, eat carbohydrate before midday or afternoon. So yeah. it was like my first question would be: How do you do to make participants come back after your protocols because they are very heavy? But is it a question that you have in mind to look at other things like how the athletes perceive that kind of training when it's prolonged, when, when, when it's very hard to do day after day and not eating carbohydrate plus high intensity training? It's very difficult, I mean, to, to do every day. So Yeah, it's a, a really good maybe? question. Yeah, we did. So we did that in um, actually that study we did in Brazil with some. So I think it was mostly PhD students who volunteered for for that study but uh, and I'm not sure I mean sometimes that's something we need to add to our studies is more descriptive and how do athletes feel those sorts of questions I'll have to check whether we did that so the the results I showed you was from the first part of the study where we were just looking at one one exercise or they came in three times but one exercise we've just completed where they trained for four weeks doing so one group did the normal training and one group did the training twice per day and so I, I don't have those results yet but I'll have to ask if we've I mean I can definitely ask the the researchers who are there every day with the athletes but yeah when I went over to Brazil to do some of the or to help with some of the biopsies and it was a very very hard training session because The glycogen depletion is very difficult as well. So we do like 90 minutes, I think, at just below the lactate threshold. And then they did um, 20 or 30 minutes of interval training to try and deplete the, the muscle glycogen from the fast twitch fibers. And then they have to go to bed without having any, any carbohydrates and then coming in the next day. So yeah, it's definitely, definitely very difficult. So the... Um, I think you'd want to be seeing some big differences in performance before before you'd want to try and adopt adopt that type of training. Hmm. Sorry for my English. Oh, sorry for my French. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think that your presentation of uh, polarized training is the way for all events? Is the same for endurance sport or sprint? Evans. 
Okay, yep. I think the, the research that's been done has been just with endurance athletes. And so with the endurance athletes, that's also starting from, from rowing. So, you know, something like rowing seven or eight minutes all out, but then also going up to, I think they've also looked with cross-country skiers who are doing, you know, many hours for, for a competition. So I think anything that we, um, you know, classify as, a, as an aerobic type sport, then I think that type of polarised training seems to be what athletes are doing and I think it also, it also seems to make sense. But I think if we're talking about... Um, you know, team sports or or sprinters. Then I don't think, as far as I know, there's no there's no evidence to support that type of training for those sports. So yeah, talking about um, sports that require a very high VO2 max and a very high aerobic power. Okay, and um, also, uh, do you think your the polarized training it's better for um, sport like skiing, cross country skiing, and uh, cycling, rowing, and um, the difference with uh, running. Uh, because I think the low intensity is very important for. Come on, this for the glee. Glee. For the glee. Slide, slide sport. Okay. It's better to have a lot of training in low intensity because for the technical it's very important and for running i don't imagine that marathoners who have the the specific uh, speed just in the middle of of the of the curve we have no marathoner in the world the best marathoner in the world we we don't train at this speed. It's interesting. I mean, I don't, I don't work a lot with, with marathon, but every now and again, sometimes in different books, and you don't know how much you can trust them, you will see um, training programs of, of different athletes. And I think so when I've... And this is where I think it's a really interesting question, is when I've seen some of the training programs, I guess, of the Kenyan athletes who are who are quite, you know, obviously dominating some of those, uh, the, those uh, marathon-type events, they actually do do a lot of training which would probably be at my VO2 max, but is at quite a low intensity for them. I think if you were to look at the, the lactate threshold, they actually do do quite a, a high volume of, like I said, high intensity for, m for me, but relatively low intensity for them. And I've, I've spoken to one of the coaches in Australia who works with some of the, um, the race walkers and he showed me one of his training programs and when I looked at it, it was, it was pretty similar to a polarised model. The only difference was that they did one session a week. And this was with the, he did some marathon runners as well. With the marathon runners, they did one session a week at around about the lactate threshold, which is probably going to, you know, getting close to sort of a little bit above race pace. So, um, I, be, I mean, it sounds like you work with those athletes. I'll be interested to talk to you. But when I, when I have looked at those programs, I think you could argue that they still do, there is still quite a, a polarised approach where there's a really high volume of training at one end, even if it's, it looks at moderately high intensity, and they still do some interval training and some high intensity training. But, but you may have a different perspective that you can offer. The last... Uh, yep. Please. Yep. Um, when you speak about the cold water, yep. uh, what the temperature of cold water? So we norm and we normally do around about ten degrees for ten to fifteen minutes. And so we did a little bit of research, just trying to find out what the athletes could cope with. And also, if you go much colder, they can't stay in the water long enough to get the temperature down. So it needs to be a temperature that's low, but that they, they can also stay in the water for 10 or 15 minutes. So normally most of the research is around about between 10 and 15 degrees. We also, um, just to add to that, we did a, a study here at INCEPT where we used the, the cryotherapy chamber. And 
when we did that, we didn't take muscle biopsies, we just blood and performance, but we didn't see any, so that's obviously a lot colder, but we didn't see any improvement with training when we get the athletes to do um, cryotherapy after each training session. Uh, yes, just a quick question. I'm just curious. Uh, you mentioned uh, two kind of uh, genotypes, RR and XX, one being the sprint phenotype and the other one the endurance phenotype. Yep. I was just wondering, uh, because you, you, you then mentioned that most of the good sprinters or the top sprinters are from the uh, RR type. How do we know that? Uh, and if so, uh, do we uh, proceed with some tests for some people who want to be like athletes in, uh, in running? Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, good question. So the the genotype is kind of easy because the obviously your DNA is in every cell in your body. So with, for the DNA, you can take a hair sample or a saliva sample or a blood sample. And so there's quite a few studies out there. Also one with the, the AIS maybe 15 years ago and also some recently with, um, with elite athletes from from lots of other countries, but at least in Australia, and so, yeah, Australia is not famous for, for, for sprinters, but um, none of the, all of the Australian, uh, there wasn't, so it doesn't always work both ways, but there wasn't an Australian sprinter who didn't have the, have the, the, the RR phenotype. So, I, and I think it, I have to be careful here because it's not enough on its own, um, there's probably other things that are, are going along with that. But it seems that if you do have the RR phenotype, you're more likely to be a sprinter. But to, to answer the, the second part of your question, it, it's obviously much more complicated. I mean, you've got something like 20,000 you know, genes in, um, in your body. So we know that's going to be more than one. So it's too early to to line up school children and go, you know, you over this way and you over over this side and and also, you know, at the at the moment, the best predictor is going to be a stopwatch. You know, someone who runs fast, okay, you can be a sprinter, someone who so we're not at that not at the level of technology where we can can use the use the genotype to actually predict who's going to be a sprinter, who's going to be a, an endurance athlete. I think um, still early days. What I think it um, may, I think it's going to be more useful with training, and also it'd be interesting with athletes. But I think especially with health, because I think what we're what we're already seeing is that some people respond better to a certain type of training than others. So that's that's more where I think it's more likely to go is that based on a bunch of different things. It might be your current fitness, your injury history, and your genotype. Then we can start to, you know, design a training program. And it may be that you know, there's also some genes which seem to predict injury as well, especially ligament and, and tendon injury. So it may be that, okay, if someone's more predisposed to injury, we try and do less high impact training on their joints or things like that. So I think in the future we'll be able to use, and hopefully not too far into the future, be able to use this genetic information to design better better training programs. But I think trying to identify a basketballer or a marathon or a marathon athlete or a sprinter or a swimmer, I think that's probably a probably a long way off into the future. Um, it's a little bit far from the theme, but you talked at the beginning uh, of the um, empirical knowledge of coaches. So uh, I wonder if it happens to you um, very often to, or often, to start a research based on this kind of observation. And uh, do you think it, that uh, that kind of knowledge uh, deserves more further investigations? If not, thank you. Yeah, I think it's um, it's a really good question, and I think you see both happening. 
And when you when you talk to people, people give an example, and, you know, maybe talk about the, you know, the the Fosbury flop. So for for high jump, you know, everyone was doing the the scissor kick, and then Fosbury f came along and did the you know did the Fosbury flop, and then lots of biomechanicists biomechanists spent lots of time explaining the physics of why that was a good way to jump, and so I, I think that's important because that still leads to probably improvement in the technique done by Fosbury. But I think, you know, the other side, I think you've also got really good examples. I think like some of the nutrition, I think, comes from a, from a scientific base. And we've seen, you know, even things like creatine or beta alanine have come from the laboratory to being used by athletes. I think a really good example is, um, you know, the, the speed skates in ice skating. So that came from the laboratory of trying of a someone who was a biomechanist trying to work out how they could increase the time that the skate stayed in contact with the ice so you could increase the, the length of time that the force was applied to the ice. And that's a really great story because it took probably about 20 years for athletes to adopt the, the so-called slap skates. And when they adopted it, they broke every single world record at the Lillehammer Olympics and they, um, they won every single gold medal as well, the Dutch at that particular Olympics. So I think it goes both ways. I think sometimes, you know, scientists are behind the athletes and maybe proving that what athletes and coaches are doing works and hopefully also trying to op optimise and improve what the athletes and coaches are doing. And, but I hope also that there's also sports scientists who are coming with, with new information that, that some more courageous coaches can can maybe adopt, and that can that can also um, help the athletes to improve their performance. Yeah, because it, this kind of question uh, occurred to me um, because uh, sometimes what coaches do um, just seems to, to be contradictory um, uh, towards science. So, uh, but strangely or not, it works. So. Uh, mm, Sometimes I just wonder we, we are not looking that well at the uh, at the phenomenon. So uh, uh yeah, I think it's a bit of both, and I think that um, you know there's um, yeah a lot of coaches with the athletes every day. You know they've got lots of experience, and you've also got that talk talking to the coach. And so I mean I think that's an important part as well. But I think it's also kind of tricky to say if something works or not. I mean, if you, if an athlete wins a gold medal, does that mean the training worked? Yeah. Or maybe they're just an amazing athlete and almost wouldn't matter what training you get. So I think we have to be... Despite the training. Yeah, you have to be a little bit careful there. But I think also we can't, um, we have to, you know, probably spend more time with the coaches. Because like I said, the coaches are with the athletes every day. They've got lots of information and lots of good ideas and like I said I mean that um, the the research that we've done with the bicarbonate and the the muscle pH and that sort of stuff that came from a coach I said I was just working with kayak athletes and standing with the coach one day and I remember she said that phrase acid destroys mitochondria and I went on the internet and looked for anything I could possibly find that that said that I couldn't find anything but you know I think she was probably, you know, there was something in what she what she said there, even though she didn't know the reason why. So I think, yeah, it's both. Hopefully, we've got the um, the coaches that listen to, to the athlete or the coaches listen to the sports scientists sometime, but we also need to listen to the to the coaches. And I think also, from my experience working at the you know the Institute of Sport, the most important thing to remember is that the you know the coach's job depends on getting results so as a scientist or as a or in the laboratory or a sports scientist I'll still have a job if the athletes aren't winning gold medals so I think so what I'm saying is I can understand why you know a coach is or is going to be cautious because they need to you know they need to be really certain about what they're doing is contributing to improving the athlete's performance thank you so much pleasure
Um, I want to understand why the, the work in the middle of, uh, of speed is bad. Um, if I understand your presentation, mm -hmm. is the atmosphere in the mitochondria is too, too acid? And um, the second question, why, why if it's too acid in the middle speed, why is good for high speed? It's a great question, and lots of people have asked me that <laughs> that question. So I think um, the first part, I think we have to be careful with, um, you know, kind of good or bad. So I think what I think is that too much of training in that middle is probably not good. And I think, you know, we see lots of things, you know, even things like vitamins, you know, you see like something like vitamin C a little bit might be good for you, but if you take lots and lots of vitamin C, you know, then it's dangerous for your, for your health. So I think what I'm saying, so I think, and we still need to do more research, but I think you don't want to do too much training in that middle. And to answer the second part of your question, I think the difference is doing a lot of, a long training with the acid in the muscles is maybe not the best way to train. So when you do the high intensity interval training, you know, you are getting a big increase in acid, but it's for quite a, it's a short time that it's in your muscle. And also maybe the, the stimulus can, can overcome the disadvantage of the, um, of the, um, of having the acid in the muscle. So yeah, so just quick summary. So I think, like I said, a lot of the athletes that I know in Australia do do maybe one session per week at the lactate threshold, but I don't, and I'd be interested to talk to anyone in the room, I don't find a lot of athletes that will do three or four sessions at the lactate threshold. So I think naturally over the years and with experience, I think athletes and coaches have learned not to do too much training in that middle. And as I said, I need to do a little bit more research, but I think it's possibly that prolonged training, because if you're doing a lactate threshold training, it might be 40, 50, 60 minutes with uh, quite a high degree of acid in the muscle. And so I think it's that prolonged training with um, acid in the muscle, which is maybe, is potentially detrimental. Yeah, that's another option, yeah. Merci. Thank you very much, David, for the very good, very interesting presentation. A little um, take a message in French. Um, donc, si on résume la présentation très rapidement de David, donc beaucoup de volume pour développer le contenu, donc le nombre de mitochondries. Si on va avoir des adaptations au niveau fonctionnel, au niveau des mitochondries, on recommandera plutôt de la haute intensité. David vient de le réexpliquer, attention, donc euh, ne pas avoir toujours en tête le pH est négatif, mais dans certains cas, le pH acide au niveau euh, musculaire peut affecter le fonctionnement de la mitochondrie, voire le développement... Euh, des adaptations au niveau euh, mitochondrial. Il a également montré que les déplétions en glycogène, l'eau froide euh, pendant la récupération, pouvaient favoriser les adaptations au niveau mitochondrial. Et puis, il a également montré aussi, d'un point de vue génotypique, euh, différents profils euh, d'athlètes, d'élite athlète, enfin d'athlète élite, pardon, euh, avec euh, des génotypes XX ou RR qui peuvent euh, répondre beaucoup mieux à certains stimuli d'entraînement. Je vous remercie à tous, je vous remercie donc pour votre présence ainsi que ceux qui sont présents sur le Grand Concept et je vous dis à bientôt. Au revoir.